Good morning, Alliance Church. We are glad you are here today. Will you stand and join us as we sing? Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way. person. We're glad you're here. Um, Jesus changes lives. And we're going to get a chance to hear about that today. Um, but uh, there's, there's so much hope in Jesus. And we're going to sing another song uh, right now called Living Water that talks about uh, letting that spirit uh, overflow inside of us, letting that, that story and that hope that we have in Jesus uh, just just fill us and overflow uh, to those around us who who can know uh, and experience Jesus like like we have
Thank you, Joey. Amen. Let's pray together before you guys have a seat. This was sweet. Great way to start this service. Let's just pray together. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to worship. Oh, Lord, stir in our hearts today. Let us see what it is that you are doing in us and around us and through us as well as through others. Let us be transformed by your spirit today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Just a couple of things to draw your attention to. In your worship folders, if you have one, turn to the center section of your worship folders. First and foremost, just in a slight adjustment for you high schoolers, 5 o'clock is the start time for the girls' concept tonight. 5 o'clock, not 6.30 as it says there. Gentlemen, you will be starting at 6.30. Both are at Pastor Chris's house. Any questions on that, please ask Pastor Chris or myself, and I'll point you to Pastor Chris. Also, this coming Wednesday, for those of you who are a regular part of Alliance Church, you've been following with us a while, you know a couple of things. One is when it comes to student ministries, we are very active in doing a variety of things. One of those happens to be we see the importance of cross-cultural ministry experiences, and that is going to be happening this summer. What that means is our students are going to be traveling to Ecuador, and there's a lot of not only work and preparatory things that need to go into place for that, but there's also some finances that need to be raised. Which brings me to the second part of what our students oftentimes do. We have started a tradition, I think Marla Horsch had a big hand in it probably decades ago, where we make and sell pizzas, and this Wednesday is the deadline. If you have not ordered any of the pizzas and you want to order some, Wednesday is the deadline. So there is an order form out in the foyer area. Students, if you have your order forms, Wednesday's the deadline, so sell as many pizzas as you can before Wednesday, and if anyone wants to order some, that order form is out in the foyer area next to or near the coffee pots. Okay, two more announcements to go. One is Ruby's Pantry is coming up, not this Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from. We're a little bit short on volunteers. You know, at Alliance Church, we, our core values are worship, connect, and serve. And this is an opportunity, I was thinking about this and reflecting on this, this is an opportunity to serve. Some of us, we just don't see, I don't know that I want to do that, I don't know that I, I'm engaged with that. Here's the reality, and I was contemplating this. Ruby's Pantry, if you're available, offers a variety of ways that you can serve. Some of it is loading vehicles, some of it is directing traffic, some of it's loading up carts, some of it's organizational aspects, but there's a a lot of variety that comes with it. But one of the things that I was impacted by just to be able to share is Ruby's Pantry gives you an opportunity to interact with people. Some of these people coming through have had a a bad day. You know they've had a bad day. And I get just a short window where I can maybe speak some form of encouragement or love to them. Others perhaps have no idea of what grace is, what love is, what Christianity is. And that, again, I have just a short window where I can display the love of Christ in those moments. They get a devotional, everyone that comes by. All I'm getting at is there's opportunity to minister through Ruby's Pantry. We're giving a service, we're bringing food, but we need people to be able to do that. One role specifically that we need this coming is someone who's just as good at bundling up in warm clothes and helping to direct traffic. So if you're available for that, you talk to Dawn uh, after the service, the Secretary Dawn, she's way in the back there. You'll know her by, I don't know, pink, purple coat. She's next to Tom. If you don't know any of either of them, just say, at the end of the service, you don't know who I'm talking about, just stand up and say, who's Dawn? Who's Tom? Just yell it out loud and they'll find out, okay? One final announcement, next Sunday is our annual meeting. So we encourage you, please, members, we really want, and I would even use a stronger word, expect your presence to be here at the annual meeting. Several elements will need to be talked about. One is going to be, we're going to talk about all the cool things and good things that the Lord has done over this last year through the different ministries of Alliance Church. We're going to need your input and your help when it comes to the election of officers to the elder board as well as the management team. We will also need your input in putting together the team for the nominating. So there's elements there that we need members to be able to interject into. In addition, we need members to be able to hear what is the projected proposed budget and to be able to approve that proposed budget. So again, we need members to be there. In addition to that, we want you to hear the good stuff, but also some of the challenges that we're facing. So we would invite members, please consider your presence to be here as 
necessary. If you're a non-member, you're welcome to attend, but you just don't have the presence to be able to vote on some of those things, but we certainly would invite and encourage all non-members to attend as well. That's going to be following the service next week. There will be a meal provided, whether you're a member or non-member, we don't care. Go ahead and stick around for the meal. We'll eat together, but the annual meeting then will start at around 11 o'clock next Sunday following the service. Okay. If you have questions, by all means, please talk to me or one of the elders, one of the staff after the service. And that does it for my announcements. We're going to invite the ushers to come forward and we're going to receive this morning's offerings. I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do with us and in us today. We have a great moment. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit of testimony coming before us. And I'm excited to see what the Spirit's going to do in our lives. So let's pray for this opportunity to give back to the Lord in worship. Lord, thank you. You have blessed us. We look at the challenges that we face in our society and our culture and with this economy, and yet you have been faithful. And so we ask, God, will you continue to lead us into worship, not only with songs. As we look at your scripture, we praise you and we worship you. As you transform our hearts, we praise you and we worship you. But also as we look at this opportunity to give back to you, Lord, draw our hearts to worship you. Help us to see God, the Father, Almighty, Jesus Christ, sitting on his throne, exalted. This is all for you and because of you. And so we recognize who you are and we worship you together today. So I ask that you will take these tithes, gifts, and offerings, and that you will use them for your glory as you see fit here at Alliance Church and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you. Go ahead and grab a seat. So last fall, we invited a number of people from the church. Elders is what we started with, and we expanded it to other people from the church to share with us and answer the question that we just sang about is, how is God good? And so following the service, starting last September, and we went through Christmas, where we invited these people to basically share their story about why is God good or how have you seen the goodness of God in your life. And so one such person is going to be sharing with us this morning, and it came from a moment when I heard her share this, it was in December, and I was just, I was struck by her message, and it reminded me of several things. One, about 20 years ago, give or take, I've been in ministry for almost 25 years now, and early on, roughly in that five-year mark, I was challenged by a colleague, and, and we were wrestling with some stuff, and he challenged me with this reality. He said, you know, he said, you can always teach out of your own transformation. And so he, he challenged me. He's like, if you are in the Word and you are being transformed by what God has for you, you have something to share. And it comes in this idea of sharing your own story and what God has done in you, and you share that testimony, and it's like that's God speaking through his word. If I'm being transformed by what it is that he has for me, and I hope that you all find moments in your life where God is transforming you because of his word. And we're going to hear one of those this morning. But I was struck with this verse then. I want to kind of commission Nancy before I have her come up here. I I was shaking my Bible, and I turned the page. Give me a moment. There we go. In 1 Peter chapter 3, I think this is oftentimes misunderstood, but I think it still gives us a good picture if we understand what this is saying. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and this is what it says. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord, and be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And I see that resonating with the message that Nancy has for us here this morning. So Nancy, you come and share us, share with us. Well, that, oh, I see. Good morning. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. I was asked to answer the question, and Ryan already explained it, why God is good, and using my life testimony as an answer to that. Please pray with me. Father, I commit this time to you. My prayer has been that you would bring to my mind the ways that you want to show yourself through how you've worked in my life from my unique perspective. Not to entertain, not to be about what I've done or not done, good or bad, but to testify of the goodness of God through who you made me to be and what you've done and are doing in my life. I ask that you would get the glory if I mess up or how I show up, whether I go out with a bomb or a blast. I pray that your will will be done because you are always good. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a few songs that came to mind, and they just sang the one that I asked them to, the goodness of God that says, all my life you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will tell of the goodness of God. Another one is, I've been through enough to know he'll be enough for me. And the last one is, yes, he has been faithful, faithful to me. I wasn't sure where to start. I've taken this from 25 pages down to eight, and it's still too long. But uh, I'm going to give you the Cliffs version of how he has shown his goodness in my life. If you're note-takers, I've got numbers. If you're not, just sit back, listen, and enjoy. Number one reason is God is good in my design. I'm thankful for that at the age of 71 years of age, I am content to be a forever single, never married woman. I am single by design, meaning that the reason I'm not married isn't because there's something wrong with me, like being too fat, too not smart enough, not attractive enough, blah, 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 but God had a plan, and his plan for my life before I was born was single and written in his book for this season. Being single has allowed me the freedom to go places and see and do things that were never on my bucket list 
or any list for that matter, which I could not have done had my life been any other way. Number two, the salvation. God is good in the salvation coming to the Schultz household. Neither my parents <clears throat> were raised in a Christian home, but my four siblings and I were. And this is my Uncle Larry's story. My dad's brother Larry was having a discussion with my grandpa, grandma and grandpa one day after the Jehovah's Witness that had been at their home, and they talked about heaven and hell, and he wanted to know the truth. And so he asked my aunt if he knew of a pastor that they could talk to. And uh, my mom and her sister, uh, Lior, had been to the Assembly of God Church in Little Falls for some youth events. And so she said, you know, they could talk to, talk to the pastor. So they went to earth, uh, church early that Sunday and uh, to talk to the pastor before church, and they, they couldn't get in. The door was locked. And this is from the pastor's perspective of what happened. He'd been in his study early in the afternoon and was having a hard time settling upon what he should preach, and nothing came to him. In desperation, he got down on his knees, and he cried out to God to give him what he wanted to share. It went on for quite a while, and nothing happened. So he prostrated himself on the study floor and began to cry out with groanings in earnest petition, but still nothing came. This went on for several hours, and when he finally looked at his watch, he realized it was time to get ready for the service. He still didn't know what to preach and he got, when he got to the pulpit, but he said he felt a fire burning in his soul, and the scriptures from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 came to him about the rapture, so he spoke about that. At the, end of the, at the end, he asked if anyone wanted to give their hearts to the Lord, and two people in the back row raised their hands, and he invited them forward, and they came. They were my aunt and uncle, and the next Sunday, my parents, grandparents, and my other aunt and two uncles all got saved. Because of his obedience and the travail of that pastor that day, salvation came to the Schultzes, and our lives and future generations have been changed forever. Number three, God is good in the beginning of my spiritual journey. My spiritual journey began in 1960 at age nine at Lake Geneva Bible Camp. I had stolen some orange lipstick, go figure. And it was the first time that I remember being confronted or convicted of sin. I asked Jesus to forgive me and come into my heart. This was an event that would be repeated several times throughout my life. Having been raised in the church, it was hard for me to discern my life from others. I knew what to do, but I didn't have the experience or the power to make it happen. I got saved every Sunday, and I don't know what happened between Monday and Saturday, but I was always thankful there was Sunday to get right with God. The goodness of God was we all survived my youth years. Age 15, being overweight with a very poor self-image, I started looking for love in all the wrong places and became a promiscuous teenager. I was still active in church. I still loved God as much as I knew how and wanted to serve him. I had religion, but no relationship. I had a heart for God, but I couldn't figure, figure out how to, do, how to be. My journey was far more legalistic than grace-filled. It was a list of rules. I couldn't smoke, I couldn't dance, I couldn't go to movies, and I couldn't play cards. And somewhere along the lines, I saw a lot of hypocrisy and found out that if I asked the questions, I was the problem. So I believed the lie that I couldn't possibly be right, and I learned not to trust myself. Everyone else was perfect, but there was something wrong with me. Those were hard times because as I look back over my life, I can see that I always had a heart for the things of God, but somehow I never got the real message of his love and grace. And here we go with numbers four, five, six, seven, and eight. God is good and faithful in keeping me in the middle of my messes through my teen years, protecting me from me, continuing to pursue me, and yet allowing me to make my own choices, never giving up on me, directing my path in tough places. I graduated from high school in 1969, and I went to Brainerd Beauty College. I got my cosmetology license, and I moved back to Little Falls. I was still struggling in my relationship with the Lord, still doing church, living a double life, hanging with wrong friends, and finally came to a place where I knew I needed to make a decision. I was either going to go to Arizona with my wrong friends, or I was going to Bible school in North Dakota. And I hope that's not mine in my pocket. <laughs> 
Thankfully, I chose Bible school. I was there for six months when they were asking people to serve in Teen Challenge Pennsylvania for the summer, and it was in my heart to do. My family and my friend church supported me, and I headed to Pennsylvania. I jumped right from the frying pan into the fire as far as my rebellion was concerned. There were more rules and more hypocrisy, and I fit right in. This was an era in my life when I told my family they should just take me out and shoot me because I was miserable and I was making them miserable. <clears throat> I, I had a holier-than-thou attitude and a list of thou shalt nots. I was far more concerned with my outward appearance than the appearance of my heart. It was more important the length of my dresses and the length of my hair than the length of my tongue. I still knew all about God, but I didn't know God. I had no understanding of the grace of God. I was religious, arrogant, know-it-all, who ended up being a pregnant missionary 2,000 miles away from home. I'd gotten involved with one of the people we were working with and was brought face-to-face with me. Where does a single missionary go? This is the place where I began to experience the love, grace, and forgiveness of God. There was no place to run, and there was nowhere to hide. I returned home humiliated, not quite so arrogant, and no longer a know-it-all. My parents were very gracious and supported me through the most difficult time of my life. I was six months pregnant when I returned home, and I didn't know what I was going to do. We decided that the fewer people that knew, the better, and I would sneak in and out of town for doctor's appointments. This was one of the hardest parts for me because I'd always been active in the church. They had supported me when I went to North Dakota and Pennsylvania. I was able to be involved in some things, but not in others. Eventually, I went to the pastor and gave him permission to go to the board. And their, their decision left me feeling like they could embrace a sinner, but not one of their own. In hindsight, they were trying to protect me, but it didn't feel like it. One of the board members' wives made all the difference when she told me that she had cried when her husband told her, and yet she always told me she hoped her daughter would be just like me, even after she found out. I am so grateful for Adeline. I eventually gave birth to a 5-pound, 13-ounce baby girl that I saw and held and was part of our family for three days. I had her dedicated before I left the hospital, and I wondered about her for the next 20 years. We had a reunion in 1995, and that's another God story for another time. The bottom line is we're in a good place today. I have five grandchildren, three great-grands, and I've heard the words, thank you for giving me life and my parents, because without you and them, I would not know God. I am thankful for the goodness of God that takes the bittersweets of our lives and turns them around for good. It is the goodness of God in restoration and reconciliation when her adopted parents, birth dad, and myself were all together at her parents' home for a special event years later. I have here with me today a very precious treasure. I'd like my daughter Dawn to stand and my niece, my grandchildren, Peyton and Savannah, my sisters, Gloria, Pat, and their husband, Randy. This is a picture of the goodness of God. Thank you. You can be seated. <laughs> Number nine, God is good. Knowing the plans he has for me to give me a future and a hope. God will use anything to get us where he wants us to be. I had no idea what I was going to do after I placed on for adoption. I was working at the Hub Cafe, and I knew there had to be more for me. My best friend came and lured me to Litchfield by telling me they were building a new jail and of all about the single men in the church in Grove City. So I moved to Litchfield, and I worked for the sheriff's office as a dispatcher jailer for 10 years. I would say living in Litchfield was probably my second most life-changing event. I went and visited a church I knew I probably should go to, but I didn't. I went to the single guy church, and the pastor from the other church began to show up everywhere. One day, something happened at the single guy church, and I knew where I needed to go. I had back to the pastor church. The reason I stayed at the pastor church was the night I went there, 
there was a man in the front of the church singing, and he was so bad. He was terrible. And I knew that if they could love him and let him <laughs> do that, that maybe there was a place for me. He also turned out to be the man that every Mother's Day, he would wish me a happy Mother's Day and make sure that I got a flower like all the other mothers. He made one of the most difficult days of my life very special. Going to the pastor church was one of the greatest blessings and turning points of my life. As a single person, it's hard to start new places. One night after church, it was, God, what am I doing here? I seem to ask that a lot. I asked the pastor's kids and their friends if they'd like to go to the a &W, and that was the beginning. We started hanging out together, and eventually they ended up at my house and started bringing their friends. God used them to bring healing to my heart left by the vacancy, left by my daughter. They never replaced her, but they did become my kids, and God allowed me to be mom to five kids. I still have contact with most of them and their children today, and the rest is his story. I came out of the closet as an unwed mother, and with my parents' blessing, I began to work with birthright. God allowed me the privilege to share in high school sex ed classes and anywhere else that they would invite me. I turned 30 in Litchfield, and for the first time in my life, I could have all my church friends, my world friends, and my family in the same room and not be afraid of being exposed. Actually, the first time in my life when everyone that knew me was talking about the same person. I no longer was no longer living a double life. The goodness of God to never give up on me. Number 10, God is good in giving second chances to get it right. Great relationships in healing. Life was good. My kids were graduating, but the job was bad, and it was time to move, God or not. It was election year, and the politics and the job were just too much. I quit the sheriff's office after 10 years, just as single as when I moved to Litchfield. A friend had a group home in northern Minnesota, and it sounded like my dream job. I moved there. It turned into my nightmare job. And the bottom line is, I called my cousin in California, who had called me before I went to the group home. They had a business that uh, they used the profits from to send kids on on short-term mission trips, mission trips. So I went to California to check it out, and I said, I could never live in California. When I called her from the group home, they said they still had a place for me, so I loaded my and my parents' car, and we headed to Bakersfield, California, the place I said I could never live. California was good to me. I made good friends, and I never felt like a single person because I was a part of families. Sundays were always hard for me because you never know where to fit in. But I found friends who invited me to lunch, and I became a part of their families, and I still have those relationships 30 years later. The Bible says that God places the solitary in families, and that's what the goodness of God looks like. Well, in Bakersfield, I got involved with the Crisis Pregnancy Center and became part of an adoption support group. And for the first time in my life, I had someone other than my journals to talk to that understood my feelings. I found out that what I was going through was normal. It was a time of personal growth and healing, and the director became one of my best friends and confidant and walked me through the ups and downs of my reunion with Dawn. The goodness of God was that he used this time of pain and brought up issues to heal some things that had been wrong for a long time and friends to walk the journey with me. 11 and 12, God is good in providing and protecting. I was in Bakersfield for eight years working for Youth Corps. They decided to sell the business, and it was like one of, one of those, okay, God, what's next? I went to work in the accounting department for Bolthouse Farms, the people that, the little carrot people. It was a good job, great people to work for, but eventually it was, God, I know you didn't put me on earth to count carrots. I was attending a new church at the time, and the associate pastor got up one Sunday and said they were going to start a new church in San Diego. Hmm, I think I'd like to do that. Hmm, that's crazy. I don't even know these people. It was another one of those, what was I thinking moments. 
Within a month or so, I'd moved out of my apartment, stored my stuff in my cousin's garage, and spent every night on another friend's couch. By the time I finally did leave to go to San Diego to live with people I didn't know, I didn't have a car or a job. This was a time in my life I had to know I could hear from God for me and trust him. It was time to do a little water walking. I didn't sink, but some days it felt like it. If I had, a, if I had had a car, that era of my life would be non-existent because I would have left. But God. I eventually got a job with Prison Fellowship, and eight months later, the pastor left to return to Bakersfield, and I was in San Diego all by myself. I got to know God as provider and protector, especially after a man got shot off the balcony of the complex next to mine. Personally, I think my dad had a U-Haul ready to come and get me anytime. But it just so happened that someone got shot in Little Falls that week also. So I knew there were no safe places, and I have to obey God, and I learn of the goodness of God as protector no matter where you live. I know the church and the pastor were just the tools that God used to get me to San Diego and Prison Fellowship. Every skill I ever needed in my career, I learned from the I learned on the jobs I had. For the most part, I was underqualified for all of them. And I'm sure some of them still can't believe that God answered their prayers with me. Number 13, God is good in discerning between good things and God things. One day I was telling God, I left my family to move to California. I left my friends when I moved to Bakersfield. Please, don't touch my job. A few months later, I was heading back to the place I was never going again. I resigned my position and moved back to Bakersfield. I have a friend who told me I need to play the flute because he's tired of moving my piano, and he doesn't think I even know how to play it. Gotta love Bill. My move back to Bakersfield taught me the difference between good things and God things, and rarely, things rarely look, out, look or turn out how you think they will. Before I went back to Bakersfield to I was sit for my cousins who were going to Guyana on a mission trip, finish writing a book on adoption with a couple of friends, and see what was next. A friend called and offered me a job. Well, it had to be God. I was willing to go without one. I worked for that company for 10 days, and I knew I had to tell them I didn't think it was a God thing when they felt like I was a godsend. The verse brought to me, God brought to me was to him who knows to do right and doesn't do it to him it is sin. I knew the right thing to do was to quit the job because they were looking for someone to make this a career, and I was not that someone. I told them if they saw me with a I will work for food sign, not to yell and point and say it's her own fault she had a job. When I was in San Diego, there was a little lady in our church named Flo. She did a paper called The Uplifter. It contained poems, inspirational stories, tidbits, and jokes, and I loved getting it. After I moved to Bakersfield, I decided to do an uplifter. And on March 28, 2000, the uplifter was born. I learned later that this is the same day that Flo passed away. And I felt like her mantle had fallen on me. And has, the uplifter has been a part of my calling in ministry for the last 23 years. We may make our plans, but God directs our steps. I'm in Bakersfield. My cousins are back. I have no job. The book isn't happening. Uh, God, any ideas? I'm heading home for vacation, and I really don't want to tell my parents I don't have a job. I got a call from a friend with an ex-gay ministry called His Way Out, and he wants to know if I'd be interested in being his secretary. Uh, Yes, and at least I can go home and tell my parents I have a job. God is a good provider. You can tell by my Social Security statement where life has taken me. To the world, it looks like I've not made very wise choices from a financial standpoint. But God, I've never missed a meal I didn't want to, and I've never not had a place to lay my head. Being at His Way Out was a place I had plenty of opportunities to say, what was I thinking? It was a place I learned that we are all broken. We just act differently, and there is no us and them. We all are in need and we need a savior and a healer. After a year and a half, some things happened that changed the ministry, and it was a very difficult time for me, and I decided a one-way ticket home and to see if God would let me know what was next. Same song, 
new location. God is good in stretching and seeing what's in my heart. I came back to Minnesota to see if God would help me figure out what he wanted to do with my life. I ended up in another place I never thought I would be. The Wilderness Fellowship was a Christian retreat center in Frederick, Wisconsin. Our family had visited there when I would come home from California in the wintertime. And then I'd go back and tell my friends about the cabins without electricity and metal toilet seats. And they thought I was crazy, and me too. I called to make a reservation at a prayer cabin, and the gal who answered the phone asked me if I'd be working, interested in working for a Christian organization. I said, well, that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. So she was leaving, and I, went, I applied for the job when we went there. And then I went back to California, get my stuff, and I moved to the wilderness for the next 15 years. I am not... Um, it was a total culture shocker, as much as moving to California was. I'm not a wilderness person. I had to learn how to deal with wood stoves, mice, mud, living in community, how to drive a four-wheeler or a skid steer, both things that I could use on another resume. I survived 15 mud seasons. God is good, and I got lots of writing materials for lessons from the woods. The wilderness verse is Hosea 2. 14 to 15, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly to her heart. This is what my time there was all about. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 3 says, and you shall earnestly remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what is in your heart whether you will keep his commandments or not. Number 15, God is good in in giving more chances for growth and change. When my dad had his first heart attack, I remember him saying to me, take care of your mother. I didn't know when or what that would look like. My dad passed away in 2005, and in 2013, we found out that my mom had some health issues. Not knowing for sure what it was going to look like for her, I was driving back to the wilderness and realized I was going to be 62 in November, and I could retire and move home to be with her. So November 13th, 2013, I retired and returned to another place I never, in my wildest imaginations, intended to be doing the things I never intended to do. I moved home to take care of my mom. I remember telling myself, I'm going home to die. Not die physically, but to die to myself, knowing that life as I knew it would no longer exist. Before you give me hero status, there were plenty days I refused to die. It was a season of mixed emotions, thoughts, joys, sorrows, pain, and laughter. It was not without its challenges, but another place that God in his goodness chose to use to change me. God is good. My mom passed away in May of 2019, and even though I will never know what God saw in me, that he would trust me to do it, I will be forever grateful for the opportunity, the time spent, memories made, and the lessons I learned about him and his care and his love for us. I got to spend the last seven years of her life with her. He promised that he would take care of me, and he has and continues to be my provider and protector. Number 16, and last but not least, God is still good even when I don't know what's next because all of my life he has been faithful and I'm still here. So what's next? I don't know. I'm thinking this might be it. Where do I fit? What is my role? What am I here for? A few months ago, I was walking up to the church door and I was asking God, what am I here for? What am I doing? It was Youth Sunday with a baptism and a picnic, and I felt I didn't know anyone well enough to go to the picnic and hang out with. Somehow, something in my brain switched, and it was, God, what do I have to offer this church? What do they have that I need? In essence, why am I here? What is my purpose, my role? I don't have the answer for all of that. 
But God asked me Sunday if I would lead a women's Bible study, and my initial reaction was, no, but God. He knows my heart, and he knows I need to be in community, and I need to start somewhere. So I said yes, and I've also said, what was I thinking? And as usual, he knows what he's doing, even when I don't. I'm grateful for the Sunday morning testimonies. I am grateful that this is a place with real, authentic people willing to be vulnerable. We're all the same, yet different in our gifts, roles, and talents. We all have a role to play in his story, the, the story that God is writing. And I want to be found playing the role he's given me. One of our Bible studies was on Mary of Bethany, and the essence of it was she did what she could. I found another one along the same line that says, don't focus on what you can't do, but focus on what you can do and do it. It may seem small to you, but really big to someone else. We all have a God story, and I want and need to hear it. We need each other. I need to know that you screw up. So when I do, I know I'm not alone. You may be a little further along in some areas than I am. Maybe you have what I need, and I might have what you need. I do have a few suggestions, and I need to start with me. Invite a single or a widow, widower, or a family to lunch. Take a youth to the Dairy Queen or Caribou. Write a note to someone that's hurting or did something that you admire them for. Watch someone's children so mom and dad can have a night out. Make and take a meal. Have someone over to play games. I don't know. Take something you like to do and do it. I never thought I would do half the things I've done in my life, this being one of them. And I have no idea what all he has prepared for me. I'm thankful that his plans included being part of the Alliance Church. Who knows what prayers landed me here? God knew I needed you, and I think maybe you need me, and we need each other. There was not one event that fixed everything that was wrong in my life, but he used a series of processes to bring me more intimately acquainted with him. There was no magic, and most things did not happen instantly. He changes us from glory to glory, and he that began the good work in us will be faithful to complete it. He changes us from glory to glory, and he that be began the good work. I, it sounds like I'm repeating myself. We just need to cooperate with him, and we have to do what he tells us to do. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's fun, and sometimes it just hurts. But God will continue and be faithful to complete it. All my life, he has been faithful. And all my life, he has been so, so good. And I will live and tell of the goodness of God. I want to leave you with my life verse. It's Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 in the Amplified Bible. Now to him who, in consequence of the action of his power, that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and do superabundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Thank you. seated actually for this this song. This is going to be a, a song of reflection. And um, as you listen to Nancy's story, you, you just saw where you 
where at every step she was just willing to do what God had her to. Whether that was moving, um, confessing sin, heart transformation, she did what God asked of her. There was an openness of her heart and the openness of her hand to just let God work in and through her. I think that's beautiful. I'm just struck uh, this morning by how how God is moving in our nation right now. And um, There's all these places where, where revival is breaking out. I keep asking, why not here? But I think that starts with our hearts in a place of being open to change, of being willing to say yes to God, of being willing to, to be transformed into the image of Jesus. So as we, as the worship team here sings a song, um, please take time to confess sin if you need to confess sin. Uh, please take time to um, pray with one another. Please take time to just love each other and and to to pursue the heart of God as we seek Him. Uh, if you need to talk to anybody, Ryan's up here. Uh, some of the other elders will be available. Uh, but but please feel free to just take this moment as a, a moment of reflection and a moment of seeking after uh, what God would have of you this morning. i 
Stand and join us as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
For some of us, we may be here and we may know religion, but we may not know God. I think today, perhaps, that's a question that we need to wrestle with. If you're here and you feel like, I know religion, but I don't know that I know God, would you choose to know him and begin that journey? Would, would you invite salvation to come into your family, as it did to the Schultz family, as Nancy shared? For others of us, maybe the way we're feeling right now is like, Lord, I want a transformation in my life. And maybe it's just inviting that spirit to, Lord, would you continue to do that transforming work? I want to see the goodness of God in my story as well. Nancy shared a great story. Well, it wasn't because Nancy did a great job, which she did, but it's because God is good and God is great. And that's what was reflected from her story. And he wants to do the same thing in you. Oh, Lord, transform us. Lord, if there's someone here that they know religion, but they don't know you, God, I just ask that they will begin that journey with you and that relationship with you today. We worship you because of your goodness. It's not our work. It's nothing that, that we can do, but it's all that you have done, Lord. Do that transforming work in us. You know where we're at. You know us better than we know ourselves. Help us to say yes to you, continue to see you at work and follow you. Or do that revival work even in our hearts today. This is for you and your glory. Lord, all of it is what you do. Would you do that with us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're invited to stay and to linger, to worship. If you want to talk to me, by all means, please do. There is some coffee and some snacks for those who would want that as well. Take some time to greet one another here today as well. But let the Lord transform you and your spirit today.